Angels of the Gospel Truth, Chapter 5, Angelic Descriptions, Seraphim, Elemental Spirits, Fiery Darts, Crouching Beasts, Wheels, Cherub, Watchers, Archangels, Destroyers, Cosmo Craters, and the Star of Bethlehem. When it comes to describing heavenly creatures generally called angels, remember not everything is clear. The only right answers are what is specifically written in the Bible, translated from Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek. Anything else is conjecture based upon logic, possibility, and old scripture writing. The joy is that we don't have all the answers yet, but we will one day. Recall the chapter, just who do you think you are? So if man is made in the image and likeness of God from the spirit breath of God mixed with clay or earth, what are angels made of? It is a very interesting question. Hebrews 1 7. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. The word spirit is pneumata in Greek or wind or breath, breath of God. So you see, angels are made of spirit and fire, energy or lightning. Angels were made directly by God. So you will see the words B'nai Elohim, or Son of God, meaning created by God directly. Adam is the only human that can make that claim. The rest of us would currently be in our fleshly state. B'nai Adama. Seraphim. The best description of seraphim are in the book of Isaiah, with further details from Numbers and Genesis. Isaiah does not call them creatures. However, you will see seraphim have characteristics that can cause some rather heated debates. Again, a reminder that a holy, heavenly being does not have to look human. A seraph, serep, or seraph, according to the Bible, is definitely not human as common pictures depict. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. So above the throne of God appears to be the station or place for seraphim described as standing, flying, and announcing the holiness of the Lord of hosts, each seraph covering their feet and their faces, demonstrating their honor and worship to the Lord. However, it is that demonstration that tends to create a quandary. Beings with six wings, or three sets of wings with strong, mighty voices, is a great description. However, what were their facial features? The Bible always seems to describe the feet of a being as bronze, etc. The seraphim covered their feet, either in response to God or the intrusion of Isaiah into the Holy of Holies of the temple. It is surprising that Isaiah was not struck dead or diseased with leprosy, as demonstrated in past intrusions. Luckily, the Hebrew translation refers us to other uses for the word seraphim. There are previous times when the seraphim made other appearances not so pleasant. Recall that not all seraphim or angels are holy. Some are fallen. Strong's exhaustive concordance presents the word seraph as saw Roth, fiery serpent with a copper color. Unbelievable, you say. Fiery serpent beings above the throne of God? Some Christians might find that appalling to discuss or believe. However, Stop and think about it. Just how awe-inspiring and mighty would such an event be? Mighty, fiery seraphim flying over and protecting the majestic and awesome throne of God. A God that is so large and majestic that he describes the earth as simply his footstool. What an incredible sight to behold. Elemental Spirits The Bible tells us that God is the Father of Lights, or then in reality, that light is energy. In regards to elemental energy, we would be referring to eco-cycles that occur in the environment. Nothing superstitious, just simply those laws of physics known and unknown that are in place. 
You can see this on a cloudy day. In the early morning, the air is calm. If the sun is lucky enough to break through the clouds, the rays of the sun will heat up an area and the cool air as wind will sweep in. Obviously, with the law of thermodynamics, cold air wants to be where the warm air is, so the sun is one of the vehicles that drives the wind around the earth. Looking behind the law of physics to the powers that drive the forces of the earth in our dimension is what is being addressed, not superstition. Simply faith in a reality that is unseen, but yet perhaps powered by the unknown 96% of matter in the universe. The fabric that physicists call dark matter, and the Bible calls a scroll. Galatians 4, 9. But now, after that, ye have known God, or rather are known of God, ye turn again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. Paul says in the preceding and forward verses, that these beings are not gods at all. However, if in verse 10, ye observe days and months and times and years, a person would be emotionally begging to be a part of these powers again. The Apostle Paul thought this to be so important that he stated in verse 11, I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Please consider the following. 1 Kings 22, 21. And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. According to the Nas Concordance in Hebrew, the word spirit is ruach or ruach, meaning breath, wind, or spirit. Nas goes on in their definitions to list air, winds, windy, thoughts, anger, and emotions. That is twice now we have moved in our discussion about the forces of nature having a connection to our thoughts and emotions. Obviously, these spiritual energies or entities can affect us as humans if we allow them to persuade us. Now let's consider the verse in context. God is before what Dr. Michael Heiser calls God's divine counsel. The same group of divine heavenly individuals portrayed in Daniel with divine beings surrounding the throne. We join the scene in 1 Kings while a prophet is speaking. 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 19. And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right side and on his left. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner, and another said, on that manner. And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. As previously discussed in regards to angels and their genesis from the book of Hebrews, angels are created from the breath of God and fire, energy, or lightning, and therefore, as Paul mentioned, elements. Biblically speaking, angels do drive the wind and the planet. Jesus did control them and had dominion over them as the second Adam and is obviously being the Son of God. Further, God did speak from a whirlwind, we commonly call a tornado. Since Enoch and Elijah were transported to heaven in chariots in a whirlwind carried by the angels, where is the superstition? If true, the upcoming verse in 2 Peter is a judgment. Revelation 7.1 And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Second Peter 3.10 But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Here is a familiar Bible passage, so familiar I thought that I had included it. Jesus was met with a sudden storm on his way to the Gergesenes to free the exceedingly fierce and demon-possessed man living in the tombs that chains could not hold. Matthew chapter 8, verse 26. And he saith unto them, 
Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Obviously, Jesus can command what he wants, but the sudden storm that came upon them was not a meteorological cold front sweeping down over warm water, causing an atmospheric anomaly. It was a tempest full of spiritual energy directed at him and the disciples. More spiritual in nature, you might say. Just for fun, take a look at the photo on the next couple of pages of a typical random sunset. Enjoy the beauty of it. Then search the clouds for the faces and silhouettes of possibly three angels streaking through the sky. If you look up into the clouds, you will often see someone is looking back. Where do you think the cover photo came from? If not, it is okay to dream. Fiery darts and IEDs. Genesis 4 calls them crouching beasts. Simply ultra-powerful arrows from the evil ones. These are temptations, accusations, and hindrances. Satan is a singular being and not omnipresent. These fiery darts have a special characteristic. The Apostle Paul likened them to fuel-filled or flammable Roman arrows shot at a soldier clad in Christian armor, utilizing the shield of faith to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Of course, Paul nailed it on the definition. They are indeed fuel-filled. A Roman soldier was to soak his shield in the water so that when the fire made contact with the shield, the fire would be quenched. In reality, you are that Roman soldier. In fact, you are better because you don't need a shield. Jesus is the word and the water of life. Soak him up and the ultra-powerful fiery darts will not even have a spark. Other than Adam and Eve, Cain was obviously one of the first people to deal with fiery darts or temptations. It is amazing just how powerful these entities or powers can be. Yes, they are real entities. Let's look at the verse. For us in our time, fiery dart might have a better explanation with the description of a hidden clinging IED or improvised explosive device. Once the hidden device is set, all the enemy has to do is wait with painstaking anticipation to see what action takes place. Cain's instruction from God was to master the temptation. Genesis chapter 4 verse 7. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. In Hebrew, sin, lieth, or robes, at the door, becomes is crouching at the door. Robes is used three times in the Bible. Genesis 49, 14, contains the description of a mule with two heavy loads, one heavy load on each side straddling his back. The mule, burdened and exhausted by his load, finally gives way and couches down or begins lying down. Couching, centering, and supporting himself between his two burdens, the mule or beast lies at the door, crouching in wait. Exodus 23.5, the beast lying in wait while loathing you and despising his load, desperately waiting and yearning for release. In Hebrew, his desire is in the word T-E-S-U-Q-U-A-T-O-W. It is the desire that a man has for a woman. If you are a man, you know how strong that desire can be. How incredible. The clinging, burdened mule, fiery dart, cannot go anywhere until the person it hates chooses to act, releasing the fuel-loaded burden upon the person. It is a fiery dart loaded with energy and burdensome weight. Once action is taken, the crouching, fuel-filled, fiery dart transfers that energy and burdensome weight to its victim. The victim has now committed the sin, feels an incredible shaking and trembling energy rush of adrenaline and false excitement, unknowingly trapped by the burden of the invisible weight that they now bear. That sounds dreadful. Hence, Cain's act towards his brother Abel and the incredible burden bore as a result. Before we continue, let's apply what we have learned impossibly 
a more realistic and entertaining way. We have been discussing angels, darts, fire, arrows, wind, emotion, and seasons of the year. Suddenly, out of our imagination, pops a red-winged Cupid with a bow in his hand, shooting fiery darts and wreaking havoc with the nations, our lives, and entertainment budgets during the month of February every year. I will leave the rest to your knowledge of wind, pheromones, hormones, perfume, romance, love, and temptation. All is fair in love and war. Johnny Cash sang it this way. I believe June Cash wrote the song. The ring of fire. Love is a burning thing, and it makes a fiery ring, bound by wild desire. I fell into a ring of fire.